IERUK. He's uh, had many talks in basic training college before, and we welcome him once again. And he's a very many high profile uh, speaker before, such as Cecil Andrews, which was last year here in this theater. Um, and then uh, we have Dr. James White from Alpha and Omega Ministries in Japan in uh, South America, Phoenix, Arizona. He's an accomplished debater, professor, and author of many books such as King James, Only Controversy, and Forgotten Trinity. So we welcome both speakers here tonight. And just to run over the format of the debate today, it will be each speaker will have an opening of 20 minutes, followed by a reply of 10 minutes each. Then there will be a crossfire of 5 minutes, followed by question and answers, which will be 30 minutes long, and there will be a concluding statement from each speaker, which will be 5 minutes long as well. Uh, should I please ask everybody to hold their questions till the end? Uh, and whenever there is a question on the session, please have the question uh, and you know, just a clear, laid out question, nothing too long because we, have, we won't have enough time, we won't give everyone a fair chance. And each speaker will have equal amounts of questions, just to make it fair. Uh, so, to, whenever there's one minute left in the debate, I will bang my hand up the table, something like this, to signify to the speakers that there's one minute left. If any speaker goes over time, the time will be deducted in the end from their uh, following sessions. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome Brother Namchi first. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. All praises are due to God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Jesus, and the God of Muhammad, peace be upon them all, all of whom worship uh, the same God, all of whom preach the same message, all of whom preach the same faith in different words, to different people, in different times, in different places. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Abdan Rashid from London, um, and it is a privilege once again to debate um, a reputable scholar such as Dr. James White in Ireland. Today's topic is, did Jesus and Muhammad preach the same faith? This is a very, very interesting topic. Before we actually go into the topic, ladies and gentlemen, we have to determine as to where and when and how do, uh, these prophets actually preached. The Christians and Muslims are unanimous on one point, and that point is that Jesus was definitely a prophet of God. He was definitely a messenger of God. And in fact, the Muslims believe that he is one of the top five messengers of God, including, of course, uh, Moses, Abraham, Noah, and Muhammad. Peace be upon them all. And um, we know that Jesus came to the Israelites in the first century. And historically speaking, uh, we cannot simply separate Jesus from his Jewish milieu. Let me explain. Jesus came to the Jews. This much is very clear, even in the Gospels. And he never actively preached to the Gentiles. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse um, 24, we are told that he uh, told his companions, his disciples, that I was not sent to anyone but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in other words, Jesus is telling his disciples here that I was sent only to the Israelites. Hence, no preaching to the Gentiles or the Romans or the Greeks at the time. So this was an Israelite prophet, historically speaking. And most historians, they don't actually take the four Gospels very seriously as historical documents. The four Gospels were written for religious audience, audiences, uh, people who believed in Jesus Christ as a messianic figure, some believed to him to be uh, God in flesh, some believed him to be a messenger of God, some actually asserted that he was a prophet of God. And there were diversions and um, distinct views among Christians prevalent at the time, uh, uh, the time of Jesus, not only at his time, of course, in the first century, later, uh, later first century, in the second century, and the third century. So we have Christian groups believing in different things in different places um, um, at different times. So we have a group called the Abunites, who were Jewish Christians, who were Jews, law-observing Jews, who believed in Jesus Christ as a prophet of God, as a messenger of God, and they had two groups within themselves. One group actually believed that he had a virgin birth, 
the other group of Abionites actually didn't believe in the virgin birth. This is confirmed by a third century church father called Origen, that the Abionites were actually split on this very issue. So the Abionites believed in Jesus Christ and they never believed that he was God in the flesh. In fact, the Abionites believed that Paul was an apostate from the law of the Jews. In other words, Paul was a liar. He simply cannot be followed, he must be rejected because he came and he simply did away with the law. And as we read the writings of Paul, we clearly see that Paul came and he stated that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. Um, hence, for that reason, law is no longer necessary for Christians to follow. Christians don't have to circumcise and don't have to follow the Jewish dietary laws. So, for this reason, these Abionites, Jewish Christians, Jews who believed in Jesus Christ, rejected Paul. And there were other, of course, Christians who followed uh, James or the Church of Jerusalem, which, were, which was actually against some of the teachings Paul had to share with the Gentile Christian world at the time. So Jesus came and he preached in the first century in a very Jewish milieu, in a very Jewish environment, talking to the Jews, preaching to the Jews. And what faith was he preaching to the Jews? This is the question now. Where do the Christians differ from the Jews? The Christian, Christians differ with the Jews on a major issue known as the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. Or they, of course, differ with the Jews on this issue of atonement by uh, Jesus giving his own life on the cross. And there are many more things we can discuss. So, what was he actually preaching? What was <laughs> Jesus trying to do in the first century with the Jews? When we actually read his, uh, his views in the four Gospels. Now, how do we determine as to what he preached and what he told his people? The only sources available to us today are the four Gospels about his life. And unfortunately, all other documents were systemically destroyed by the church in the early centuries, especially in the fourth century when the church came to power, the Trinitarian Church, uh, laws were issued to suppress all other beliefs and all other writings which the Christians had. And this is clearly stated in the Theodosian Code. If you don't believe me, you need to pick up the, the Theodosian Code when Emperor Theodosius was governing the Roman world and the law was issued and Christians who differed with the established church, the Trinitarian Church, were actually heavily, actively pursued and systemically destroyed. This is another topic as such. So how do we know what Jesus actually preached? The Gospels cannot possibly be the, the, the best sources to, to find out what Jesus actually, actually preached because gospels, them, gospels themselves very often actually differ with each other on major details. This again is another topic in itself. But give you a few examples. To give you a few examples. In the Gospels, we have three Gospels, the first three Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These three Gospels are known as the Synoptic Gospels. And this is like a triangular um, source material we have. And the Gospel of Mark is thought to be the earliest Gospel among these three Gospels. And the Gospel of Mark took information from the, some oral tradition which was around at the time. And it is thought that Mark actually took what he took from Peter. But this is only an assertion, it's only a claim. I would like James to come and give us solid evidence in this regard to show that Mark definitely took from Peter and we need some testimonies from the first century. Not from the second century, from the first century. No speculations are good enough for this because this is about faith, this is about belief. So in order to establish your faith, uh, you must have solid, robust grounds which are certain, certain realities. No speculations are good enough in this regard. So it is thought that Mark took from Peter, and it is also thought by scholars that Luke and Matthew were heavily copying from not only Mark, another source called the Q uh, document, uh, or there was a document called uh, Q. It's, it's of course uh, uh, a hypothesis, and it is not certain whether Q ever existed, but the scholars assert that because there is some information which cannot be found in the book of Mark, it must have been copied by Luke and Matthew, from another source called Q. Then we have the Johannine tradition, which is entirely different. The Christology, uh, or Christology actually goes to a different level.
level, different dimension. Here in the Gospel of John, Jesus is raised from a prophet, from a messiah, from a, from a prophet uh, or a messenger to a divine figure. He becomes a divine figure all of a sudden in the Gospel of John. And I am state, statements actually emerge. These I am statements cannot be found in the synoptic tradition. So for some reason, John had to actually set up the Christology uh, about Jesus Christ and his view on Jesus Christ and all of a sudden Jesus turns into a different person. So how do we know what Jesus actually preached? It is very difficult to determine. For that reason, we must go to historians who actually scrutinize every single source about Jesus Christ and take the most authentic information about him. So what do historians come up with? What do they think Jesus actually preached? So we have one such historian known as James D.G. Dunn, for example. He's one of the most prolific uh, authors uh, alive today writing on patristic history, especially uh, the history of Christianity in the first century. And he is of the view that all we can establish about Jesus Christ for certain is that he was a Jewish prophet who preached to the Jews in the first century. Who preached to the Jews in the first century and he was a strict law-abiding Jew and he was a revolutionary character, i.e. he was a messiah, he claimed to be a messiah, he was a messianic figure. That's all we can establish about Jesus Christ. And this is a man who is one of the biggest authorities in the field. Of course, there are other scholars who also believe in the, uh, in, in the same conclusion. People like E.P. Sanders and Gita Vermes, all these people actually um, assert that all we can establish about Jews uh, or Jesus is that he was a Jewish prophet. So when we actually go to the Gospels and see some snippets of information about Jesus Christ and some of his statements or attributed to him, I as a Muslim, let me clarify very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, we as Muslims believe that the Gospels are not the Word of God. They're not the Word of God. There is Word of God in the Gospels in meaning, not in word. The authors who were writing on behalf of Jesus Christ, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they were simply writing what they thought was the truth. Now, whether what they were writing was the truth or not is another question altogether, which is another debate. But they were simply writing for their audiences, trying to give their version of Jesus Christ to people they were writing for. So, they were not writing for God, they weren't inspired by God, and if they were inspired and the Christians claimed that they were inspired, I need some evidence in this regard. Who was the first person among the, um, among the Christians or in the Christian history to tell us that these authors were actually inspired? Did they themselves claim that they were inspired? Did Matthew say that I'm writing because God is teaching me or telling me to write? Did Mark say that I'm writing because God is revealing this to me? Did John say that this is from God Almighty? If that is not the case, ladies and gentlemen, then why do we think today that these people were writing on behalf of God? Who told us that? This is the question I pose. And if that, that's not the case, then we must scrutinize this, uh, this information historically and see that a Jewish prophet in the first century, what, what would he actually preach to the Jews? Would he preach something alien to the Jews? which they would never believe in, or would he preach something to them which they would accept wholeheartedly, which some, something that made sense to them, rather than something that didn't make sense to them, such as the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is entirely alien to the Jews. Yet yeah, it, was, it wasn't alien to the Greeks and the Romans, because Greeks and Romans could accept man God. They could accept a triad formula. They could accept a Trinity, for example, because the doctrine of the Trinity in origin, philosophically, philosophically speaking, is Platonic in origin. It is Greek in origin. It is not Jewish. There is no Trinity in the Old Testament. And there are major Christian authorities who have actually acknowledged that fact. Such as William Lane Craig, who is one of the most prolific uh, Christian debaters in the world today. He has clearly acknowledged that the doctrine of the Trinity is non-existent in the Old Testament. Of course, there's another debate now about the New Testament, whether the doctrine of the Trinity actually exists in the, in the New Testament. So what did he actually preach? <coughs> we have to keep the Jewish Jesus in our minds when we are reading about him in the Gospels. Now, I believe in the Gospels there are words which may have come from Jesus Christ. 
which may have come because these authors, the gospel authors, were simply picking up information from the oral tradition which was around at the time and they may have picked up some authentic information which came from Jesus Christ. How do we know this? Now when we look at the teachings of Jesus Christ uh, to the Jews, we see that this is exactly what a Jewish prophet would preach to the Jews. And how does that conform to Islam? The question is now, did Muhammad and Jesus actually preach the same religion? No, Muhammad was not a Jewish prophet. He was definitely a prophet of God. There's no doubt about that. And we know that for a fact because he was a man of um, um, uh, a great character. For example, if he was a he could either be one of these three. Either he was a liar or truthful or deluded. Okay, when we look at his history, we know that he cannot be a liar because he was offered all the riches and pomp and glitter of this world. Okay, people came to him, they offered him money, they offered him women, they offered him power, they offered him everything he could imagine to, to achieve if he was a liar. Okay, and he refused. He said, put the sun in my right hand, put the moon in my left, I will never give up this message which is from God. He was not a liar. A liar would never put his life in danger. A liar would never put his family, the family's life uh, in, in, in danger. And his wife died because of an illness he contracted during a boycott which was inflicted against him by the Quraysh's own tribe. His daughters suffered. Two of his daughters were immediately divorced when he preached Islam to his people. And what was his message? People worship one God alone and you will prosper. And this is exactly what Jesus preached. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 12 verse 29 we are told that a Jewish man came to Jesus Christ. And he told him, how much time do you have? Five minutes, thank you. So a Jewish man comes to Jesus Christ. And he asks him, Master, what is the first commandment? What is the first commandment? And Jesus responds by saying, Hear O Israel, listen carefully. An Israelite prophet, a Jewish prophet talking to the Jews. And who are the Jews, ladies and gentlemen? Jews do not worship a trinity. They are not a trinitarian people. No scholar on the planet will ever claim that the Jews were a trinitarian people. They believed in one God, in one person. One being consisting of one person. And that person was the Father with the capital F. How do we know this? Jesus confirms this in the Gospel. In chapter 8 of the Gospel of John, verse 50 or 54, we are told that Jesus is speaking to a crowd of Jews. And he tells them, I do not glorify myself. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you, the Jews, say that he is your God. Father. Father is the God of the Jews, according to the book of Isaiah again, chapter 63, verse 16. And there are many more passages where Father with capital F is, uh, is, is shown to be the God of the Israelites. And that same God talks to the Jews in the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 6, that I am the first, I am the last, and there is no one else beside me. So the Jews don't know any other God except the Father. They don't know the Son and they don't know the Spirit. This Jewish man comes to Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, asking him, What is the first commandment, Jesus? O Master, O Rabbi, what is the first commandment? And he tells him, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Worship or love thy God with all thy mind, with all thy heart, with all thy soul. And what does the Jew say? And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, Thou hast said the truth. For well, there is one God, and there is none other but He. And then Jesus responds to him by saying, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus actually confirms what the Jew, what that Jew believes in. And remember, that Jew never worshipped the Trinity. He only worshipped the Father. When Jesus tells him that there is only one God, in his mind is only the Father. The Trinity doesn't exist. And Jesus confirms his belief. He doesn't tell him, hold on a second, you Jews. Now you've been worshipping the Father all the way in those previous centuries. Now there's a new covenant. I, the Son, am also a person within the Trinity, and so is the Spirit. So now you need to worship three persons within one being. He didn't say that to the Jew. He told him, Hear of Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And this is exactly, time up. Okay, this is exactly what Prophet Muhammad told his people, Qulu la ilaha illallah wa tuflihu. O people, listen and worship one God alone and you will prosper. Then we are told that Jesus tells his people 
that if you love me, then follow me. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 42, we are told, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. This is exactly what the Quran states, that Prophet Muhammad was told to tell his people that if you love God, follow me. I am a prophet of God, I'm a messenger of God. In John, John 14, 1, we are told to go again, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And this is exactly what Prophet Muhammad taught his people, that if you believe in God, then believe in me. Now follow the law of God. Time. Time is up. Thank you so much. Good evening and welcome. It is truly an honor to be with you here at Trinity College in Dublin and it's an honor to be debating Adnan Rashid on this very, very important topic. I think you have chosen the good thing uh, to be out this evening to ask the question, Jesus and Muhammad, did they preach the same message? Now, the debate tonight will center on whether we will allow the New Testament to define Jesus' teaching or whether we will insist upon placing it in some other context and denying its own internal consistency and harmony, and you've already seen that. Uh, historically, the only way to know what Jesus taught is to look at what was recorded in the first century about Jesus Christ and his teaching, and that is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The only sources that exist that came from the first century and that came from the context of uh, Second Temple Judaism, in which Jesus lived and preached, the message of Jesus is defined by the consistent testimony of the scriptures that come from the first century and were written by his initial followers, not by later writings of the following centuries. That, I think, is just given by the fact of logic. Now, Jesus confessed in that material that there was one true God. He often quoted the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Here in Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. Jesus taught God's law was good and unaggregated. In fact, he taught anyone who teaches you to not observe this law is the least in the kingdom of heaven. Of course, he also taught that he was the fulfillment of that law. Jesus taught his followers to pray. He taught his followers to give alms, to do good for the poor, to honor their father and their mother. Jesus was a Jewish prophet, and he addressed concerns of Second Temple Judaism. All these things would find parallels in Muhammad's teachings or in the teachings of the Jewish rabbis of Jesus' day. But to limit or even define Jesus' teachings by these things misses the whole point of the Gospels in the New Testament. You see, my friends, there was a reason why Jesus was in conflict with the Jewish leaders from the very start of his ministry. And that's the same reason why the Quran seeks to warn Christians against excess in their deen, in their religion, in Surah 4, 171. Now, one question to keep in mind this evening. What evidence is there that the author of the Quran had any knowledge at all of the content and meaning of the Christian gospel? I've never had a Muslim substantiate the idea that the author of the Quran actually knew what was in the New Testament so as to make any meaningful commentary upon it. Now I understand from the Orthodox Islamic perspective, well, the author of the Quran was Allah himself. Well, all of the historians that uh, Adnan just quoted would never accept that as a given. Not a single one of them. James D.G. Dunn wouldn't. He would say, no, we need to look at the author in the context in which he was writing. And is there any evidence that the author of the Quran even knew what the Gospels said about Jesus? That he even knew that there were Gospels? There's no evidence of that. The only verse cited directly 
from the Bible in the Quran is the Lex Taliomus, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. There's one other possible text from the Psalms, but there are even Muslim scholars that dispute whether that's the case. There is no evidence that the author of the Quran had any direct knowledge of what the New Testament actually teaches so as to respond to it. And so I just simply have to make a, a, a plea. The Quran talks about having equal weights and fair scales. Now the immediate application of that was in business, do what's right, be fair. But I think we can make a broader application of that, and Muslim writers have. The fact that Muslims should be truthful, they should use equal standards. And I submit to you that the application of naturalistic materialism and that worldview to either the Quran or the New Testament is going to result in a degradation of those texts and in an interpretation of those texts that is completely different than their authors intended. And it's my submission to you that already this evening, Adnan has used scholarship and conclusions he would never allow to be applied to the Quran, but he's applied it to the New Testament. And that is unfair. It is a violation of the Quran itself, which says to argue in a way that is best. Some translations say a way that is fair. We must use the same standards. And so to a Muslim this evening, I say, you must use the same standards you use to defend the Quran to criticize my New Testament and the Gospels. You must, or you're using different standards. We must avoid <laughs> anachronism as well. You cannot make the Quran the standard, then look back over history and say, well, if it doesn't fit this. That's reading things backwards. That's not even the, the argument of Surah 5, which we'll get into another time. Now, if Adnan Rashid accepts the words of Jesus recorded in the Quran, from 600 years later, without any textual evidence that they go back to Jesus himself, he must accept the words of Jesus in the Gospels from the first century on principle and logic. He must. If he says, well, I accept what the Quran says, but I will not accept what the Gospel of Mark says. So I'll accept something that has no textual history for 600 years, but I'll reject something that was written in the first century. That's not using fair scales, and we need to keep that in mind. Now, what was Jesus' message? And let's compare it with that of Muhammad. Really, that's the subject this evening. What was Jesus' message? Let's consider the testimony of the Gospel of Mark. Mark 1.1, we read the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, there's a textual variant there. And if you look at the best evidence, there's very strong evidence that that is the great way that it originally read. We can look at the evidence if you want to. I have it all right here on my iPad. We can look at the entirety of it. It's something we Christians do. I've worked in textual criticism for decades now, and we're well aware of these things. But Jesus is described as the Son of God, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is the very content of this message. It's not just something that was given to him and then he proclaimed to somebody else. He did that. But it's about him. That's the message. Prophets are given a message about somebody else. The prophets are never the subject of the message. In Mark 1.3, we have a quotation from the Old Testament about making ready the way of Yahweh, and it's being applied to Jesus. Now, very interestingly, uh, Adnan was talking about, well, they never would have understood the doctrine of the Trinity. The funny thing is, the New Testament writers, who all confess there's one true God, took that one name, Yahweh, and they applied it to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and differentiated between each one. Why did they do that? What were they trying to communicate? They believed the Shema, they weren't denying the Shema, and yet they applied that one name of Yahweh to Father, Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In Mark 1.15, and saying, the time is fulfilled, here's Jesus preaching, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. What's the gospel again? The gospel of Jesus Christ. He is saying to repent and believe in the gospel, the gospel that is about Jesus. It's about what Jesus is teaching and Jesus is doing. Also in Mark chapter 1, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John the Jordan. Immediately coming out by the water, he saw the heavens open, the spirit like a dove descending upon him, and a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Do Muslims believe that that happened? No. You can't. Jesus isn't the son. And here you have in the, and this is the same scholars at Adnan at this point would say this is one of the most primitive elements of the quote-unquote tradition. 
You have the Father speaking from heaven, the Spirit descending a dove, and this, and this person, Jesus, identified as the very Son of God, in whom God is well pleased. And we're only in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1, verse 23. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. He cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. Even the demons recognized who Jesus was. They didn't say, you're just a mere prophet. No, they said, you are the Holy One of God. They recognized that he was more than a mere prophet. In Mark 2, 5, when Jesus seeing their faith, he is the men who had lowered a paralytic down to Jesus through the roof, said, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And that is a proper question. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus forgave sins. And they weren't against him. And then he healed the man. Forgave him of his sins and healed him. And the people are amazed at the power and the authority that Jesus has. In, Jesus, in John Mark 2, 27, Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Son of Man. What does Son of Man mean? Son of Man could just mean a human. But that's not all the Son of Man means. In fact, we will see that there is a Son of Man in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, who appears before the Ancient of Days, and he has an everlasting kingdom, and his servants worship him with the highest form of worship. And that's who Jesus is identifying himself to be. And he says he's Lord of the Sabbath. Who established the Sabbath? Yahweh did. Jesus says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. We're only in Mark chapter 2. We're not even in the Gospel of John, are we? Let's skip along because we don't have much time. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And he summoned the crowd of his disciples and said that if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Think about that for a moment. Jesus, a mere prophet? Lose your life for my sake. Take up your cross. Doesn't make much sense in light of Surah 417, does it? Except Surah 417 stands against the entirety of history. And there's not a one person that I will quote this evening. Against the authority of the New Testament, that would verify the Quran's denial of restriction. Not a one of them. In fact, I can quote the majority of them that would say it's the most established fact of history. Beyond question. I'd be happy to debate that subject because history is all mine on that one. Anyways, whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save him. Life is dependent upon the Gospel of Jesus Christ and following him. Does that sound like just a mere Jewish prophet? Mark 8, 38, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Wow. Is this a mere prophet? Did Muhammad preach this Jesus? Where? Where? I've read all the Quran numerous times. I've read all of Bukhari and halfway through Muslim and read parts of Jamia and Termini. And I can guarantee you, Muhammad didn't know this Jesus. Didn't know this Jesus. Didn't preach his message. Mark 9, 2. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant, exceedingly white, as no longer on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Here's Elijah. He represents the prophets. Moses representing the law. The law and the prophets are speaking with the fulfillment of them, Jesus. On the mountain of transfiguration, then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Not, this is my beloved prophet. Jesus is a prophet, but he is much more than that. He is much more than that. Mark 9, 31, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered to the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. More than once, Jesus communicates this truth to his disciples. He says, I must go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man must be betrayed in the hands of men. And he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew the crucifixion was the very reason why he had come to voluntarily give his life and then to rise again on the third day. We still in the Gospel of Mark, and Jesus began to say as he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that Christ, the Son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies, I put your enemies beneath your feet. 
David himself calls him Lord, so in what sense is he his son? Here, Jesus identifies, first of all, a quotation from Psalm 110 as being the very words of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus' view of the Old Testament was it's God breathed, and we still know what it was. And we know what the Torah, the Old Testament, said in Jesus' day. And here he's quoting from the Psalms. He's quoting from the Psalm about himself. Who is this, my Lord? The Lord said to my Lord. Who is David's Lord? Well, it's Jesus. He has to be greater than David. And he's applying that to himself. We'll see. That's going to be very, very important in John chapter 4 and Mark chapter 14. Here in chapter 14, a woman anoints Jesus and knows what Jesus says. She had done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Jesus knew the gospel was for what? Israel? Yes, but for the whole world. And he knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to be buried. He knew he was going to rise again. And that, that gospel would be preached throughout the whole world. So when he's brought before the high priest in John 14, listen to these words. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it these men are testifying against you? He kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. So much for I am being only in the gospel of John. I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. That's Psalm 110 again. And coming with the clouds of heaven. That's Daniel 7. That's the Son of Man figure that has people who worship him. Did Muhammad worship Jesus? No. Jesus has people who worship him. Latruo is the term. Who worship him. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserve, deserving of death. The Jews knew what he was saying. They understood. Jesus didn't go, Oh, no, 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 guys, you didn't understand. Well, I, I didn't mean that. They knew what he was claiming for himself. And condemned him to death. And here's the text. From Daniel chapter 7. I saw in the night visions, behold, the clouds of heaven that came on like a son of man, and he came in the ancient of days, was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, and that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve Latruo, the highest form of worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That was the text Jesus applied to himself. That was his teaching, and it was not Muhammad's. It was not Muhammad's. Jesus' message included himself as the king of the kingdom, as the divine son of man, as the unique son of God, whose gospel is the sole means of salvation for all men of all nations for all times. And I substantiated that from simply the gospel of Mark. I didn't even quote from John or Paul. I could have, didn't need to. This is the consistent testimony of the entirety of the New Testament. Muhammad did not preach this message, hence the debate thesis is decided. Because the question is, did Muhammad preach the same message as Jesus? The answer is, no, he did not. And if you want a beautiful example of it, look at this. In Surah, Surah 5, Surah Al verse 116, Allah says to Jesus, Did you say to the people, Worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of law? Clearly, Shlomo, that whoever wrote Surah 5, 116 did not understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Because that's not what Christians believe. But, there you have it. And Jesus' response also is, If I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. Those words come from the 7th century. These words, Matthew 11 and 27, come from the 1st century, even by the most liberal dating. And there Jesus said, in the Synoptic Gospels, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Whoever wrote Sir 5.116 either didn't know Matthew 11.27, that's my assumption, or rejected it. So here's the question this evening. What evidence do we have that Jesus said in Matthew 11, 27? Well, from a historical perspective, historians will admit that 
We, don't, we, we cannot even begin to know what Jesus said if the Gospels are not a source for us. The author of the Quran told us that the Gospel, the Injil, was given to Jesus. That it had light and guidance. And that we, the people of the Gospel, were to judge what was contained therein. Now that was in the 7th century. How could the people of the Gospel judge by the Gospel if the Gospel had been destroyed in the 7th century? So if it existed in Muhammad's day, we know exactly what the New Testament read in its entirety in that, in that time period. We have entire copies of the New Testament that long predate the days of Muhammad. And so there's our question. The only way for Adnan to win the debate this evening is to deny what the New Testament teaches about Jesus' own words. So what does he give in the place? He quoted John 8, 54. One sentence later, Jesus said, Amen, Amen, Lego Humin. Prin Abraham Genestai, Ego I mean. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews picked up stones and stones. That was one sentence after what Adnan quoted as being from Jesus. So who's going to be consistent this evening? Who's going to use even scales? Whoever uses even scales will win the debate. That's what you need to listen to. Thank you very much for your attention.
hundreds of thousands of varying readings as to what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John may have written. Okay? If you can show me in word what they wrote, I'll give you 10,000 pounds tonight. On top of that, ladies and gentlemen, the early church fathers didn't actually believe that um, the, 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 the text or the writings of the New Testament were scripture. People like Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Papias of Hierapolis, Barnabas, Polycarp, and Hermas of Rome, these people didn't actually believe that the New Testament writings were actually the word of God. They simply referred to them as the memoirs of the apostles. Memoirs of the apostles. They never referred to them as scripture. When they said scripture, they meant the Old Testament. And this is exactly what Paul meant when Paul wrote in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 that all scripture is God breathed. He meant the Old Testament, not the New Testament because the New Testament didn't even exist. The New Testament didn't exist, ladies and gentlemen, up to the time of Irenaeus, up to the year 200 CE. It was in the year 200 when Irenaeus mentioned four Gospels together. They did exist, they were written, but they were scattered all over the Christian world. Some Christians are only reading the Gospel of Luke, for example. Some Christians are only reading the Gospel of Mark. Others weren't even aware that the Gospel of John existed. Some actually claim that the Gospel of John is heretical. Others claim the Gospel of Matthew is is a Judaizing gospel. It supports the Jews too, too much, so we can't actually take it. So there are all these debates which existed in the early centuries. So what do we do with them? Now the only option we have is to look at Jesus in his Jewish milieu, in his Jewish environment, in his Jewish context. He was a Jewish man teaching the Jews as to what he thought was the truth. And now we will see whether he preached Islam or preached a new religion based upon the doctrine of the Trinity and his crucifixion. So when the Jew comes to him asking him what is the first commandment, he tells him, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And this is exactly what the prophet of Islam taught. Another Jew comes to him and asks him, um, in the Gospel of Mark again, chapter 10, verse 17 to 18, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Here Jesus is effectively telling this Jew, I am not God, because I am not good. Why callest me thou good? There is none good except God. So here Jesus is either lying or deceiving that Jew. And then he says, to this Jew who came to him asking him, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? I may inherit salvation. And he tells him, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. This is exactly what Islam is. The prophet of Islam in the book of Bukhari, we are told in Kitab iman volume one, chapter two, Sorry, volume 1, book 2, hadith number 17. When people came to him, pledged their allegiance to the Prophet. And what did he tell them? What did he ask them to pledge? He said to them, By your own, Allah kushriku billahi shayya. Pledge with me that you will not ascribe partners with God. Wala tasriku and you will not steal. Wala tasnu and you will not commit adultery. Wala taqulu awladakum and you will not kill your own children and you will not slander, and you will not disobey in good. This is exactly what Jesus taught. And honor your mother and father. Of course the Quran in so many places states, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Be kind to your parents. Do not say oof to them. Do not say a word of contempt to your parents. This is exactly what Islam is, and this is what Jesus taught his people. Now we move on to other teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, he taught Islam submitting to the will of the Father. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, we read, Not everyone that saith unto me, Jesus is thought to have said this, Lord, Lord, shall, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone 
who saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy, in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Here, Jesus is telling them, the only one to be successful will be the ones who will submit to the will of the Father. This is exactly what Islam is. Islam is to submit to the will of God Almighty. God Almighty. So what does the Quran tell us? وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِّمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Whose word is better than the one who calls to the way of the Lord, God Almighty, and works righteous deeds and says, I am one of those who has submitted, who has submitted to the will, to the will of the Father. This is exactly what Islam is. Then, no man knows of the hour. Jesus says that in Mark 13, 32 that he is not aware of the hour. Jesus is saying that I do not know when the day of judgment is. And this is exactly what the Quran says in Surah 30, in the last verse, Surah Luqman, last verse, that all, the knowledge of five things is only with God, and one of them is the hour. So this is exactly what Jesus is teaching. And Jesus taught from Revelation. He didn't actually say anything from himself. I can of my own self do nothing. This is John 5. 30, I can of my own self do nothing. This is not God talking. This is a prophet of God talking. I can of my own self, as I hear, I judge. This is exactly what the Quran says in Surah Najm. Where Quran tells us, that Muhammad does not speak from his desires. Rather, he speaks what he receives from God Almighty. I can of my own self do nothing. This is exactly what Islam is, and that's what Jesus taught. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It is an amazing irony to me that Adnan just quoted primarily from the Gospel of John. <laughs> most of his scholars he was quoting before would reject as being historical. It's also the Gospel of John that, as Bart Urban says, clearly presents the deity of Christ. So what Adnan has done is he cuts it up into little pieces. I refuse to do that with Quran. I try to handle the Quran fairly. What you, when you have Adnan quoting John 8, 54, and saying, this shows this, and then one sentence later, Jesus identifying himself as God, and the Jews have become stones to stone him, that's not accurately handling the text of the Gospel of John. When you have him quoting the section we're quoting, Jesus said, I'm not, I'm not good and I'm not God, that young man. Maybe he was saying, why are you calling me good? Because I am God. Maybe he was trying to communicate to this young man before he corrects him in his idolatry. You need to know who you're dealing with. He's completely misread what Mark is actually saying there. And I demonstrated that because I went through the Gospel of Mark and demonstrated what? A consistent reading from Mark 1 to Mark 14. I can deal with entire texts and allow them to speak for themselves. All Adnan can do is take a part here and pull it apart. For example, we just quoted John chapter 5. Read John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 18. Jesus has just claimed to be working at, with the Father on the Sabbath day, which Jews all believe only God could do, and making himself equal with God. And Jesus is explaining why men should honor him just as they honor the Father. And it's in the context he does it. He says, I do not nothing, F how to, by myself. In other words, he's not saying, I'm some separate God from the Father. He's saying, I and the Father, we do things together. But that's the same section where he talks about giving life to people. Who gives life to people? That's God. So read John chapter 5. Look at these texts. They are consistent. I can have for perfect confidence that anyone in this room who will examine me and Adnan for consistency in our use of sources and our reading of scripture, will know what the solution to the debate tonight is, without any question whatsoever. Did Matthew or Mark claim inspiration? Did David? And yet Jesus quoted him as speaking by the Holy Spirit. For some reason, Muhammad didn't expect this very same standards Adnan expects this evening. Because in Surah 5, the Quran specifically states that the Torah and the Injil were that's all, they were sent down, they contained light and guidance, 
And the only way to read Surah 5 is that the people of Muhammad's day still had the Torah and the Injil. We know what they were, but Muhammad wouldn't have known the Isna'at chain for any of those things. That's an anachronistic application of a standard that the Jews themselves did not use. I dare it not. Show me anywhere where the Jews used your standard to know what inspiration was. If you can't show it, then stop making the argument because it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, 10,000 pounds tonight. If I can show you what Luke said. Boy, that would be very nice. That would be a lot of money. Yes. But here's the problem. The argument is backwards. The argument is saying, well, we don't know where Luke came from. Well, it had to come from someplace. We have got literally hundreds of manuscripts coming from different places in the world, and they have the same text in them. Oh, they might misspell a word over here, switch word order, but where did they all come from? If some, there's got to have been an original someplace that these all descended from, and it comes from the first century. And when he talks about hundreds of thousands of variants, he doesn't tell you that 99% of them can't be explained to you outside the Greek language, which he doesn't know when I do. There are about 1,500 to 2,000 meaningful variants, and at least we know where they are. You don't have in the suit's material, so you don't know where yours are. Be careful of the standards that you apply. Be careful of the standards that you apply. Um, I'm not quoted Matthew 15, 24. Jesus sent only the lost sheep in the house of Israel. Again, that would be like me quoting from this text in the Quran to talk about not coming to prayer as drunk and ignoring that later on the Quran says, don't drink alcohol, period. That's the exact same thing. Because the Gospel of Matthew, taken as the Gospel of Matthew, finishes with Jesus saying, go ye into all the world. You've just got to allow Matthew to speak for himself. Do you really honestly deal with an author correctly when you only read the first three chapters of his book and ignore the last section? That's what we've got going on this evening. He says, Paul simply came and did away with the law. No, that you cannot possibly read the Apostle Paul and come to that conclusion. You just cannot have read him in, in his, not even in his original language, let alone in any decent translation, Paul says the whole purpose of the Christian life, Ephesians chapter 2, by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works that any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. How do we know what those good works are? Paul says the law. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, and we will be justified by faith. He does not undo the law, he tells us what the purpose of the law always was. That's just allowing Paul to speak for himself. Let's be fair with the sources when we're using them. We were told that the Gospels cannot be the best source for knowing what Jesus taught. Um, did you notice that every time Adnan quoted this evening Jesus' teaching, what was it from? The New Testament. Has he quoted once from the Quran of Jesus' words to define the teachings of Jesus? You can't because all Jesus says in the Quran is, Worship God, and um, uh, that's it. The genus of the Quran is not a person. The genus of the Quran is an argument. The genus of the Quran never speaks from identifiable location, except once from his cradle, which was a story borrowed from the Arabic infancy gospel that came about 500 years after Jesus, and is a fictional story, but ends up in the Quran. So how does that happen? Especially when the Quran denies using previous sources or anything like that. So you can't, you can't build a theology of Jesus' teaching from the Quran, even though it quotes Jesus. Every quote in it would be rejected by every single scholar that Adnan started his presentation quoting. Every single one would reject as valid the words of the Quran at that point. Where is the consistency in our debate this evening? He said, well, you know, the Synoptic Gospels drew upon oral tradition. Yeah, they certainly did. I'm awful glad they did. I'd like to recommend to anyone who's really interested in this, look at a book that came out just a few years ago by Dr. Richard Balcom. Dr. Richard Balcom wrote a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And he talks about the fact that the Gospels take shape in the context of the church where the eyewitnesses who actually observed these things were still alive. And that those eyewitnesses had a great impact, a guiding impact, upon how the church understood these documents and, and certainly helped to preserve them. It's a very, very important book that's not easy to read and not really a lot of fun to read, but I would still recommend it to you anyways. 
We are then told that the Johannian tradition presents a completely different Jesus. Did y'all notice something? Most of Adnan's quotes came from John. Where did my quotes come from in my presentation? Mark. The allegedly most simple and primitive gospel. And what did I show you from Mark? The only way you can honestly read Mark is to recognize that Jesus is much more than a mere prophet. The only way Adnan can deal with John 5 is to isolate one verse and not tell you what the rest of it says. The rest of it says is Jesus says things like, Honor me as God of the Father and that he's the very source of life. You see, one of us could start at the beginning of the book and go to the end of the book and give you a consistent presentation. I can do that with Mark, I can do that with Matthew, Luke, and certainly John would be pretty easy to do. But Adnan can't do that. Why? Because Adnan has another authority that interrupts his ability to properly exegete the New Testament text, and that is the Quran. The problem is, the author of his book didn't know my book. The author of his book claimed to be teaching consistently with what my book said, but out of ignorance. And if you say I'm wrong, prove me wrong from the text of the Quran. Show me where the Quran interacts with the Pauline epistles. Show me where the Quran understands the high priestly role of Jesus in the book of Hebrews. Show me where the Quran understands Colossians chapter 1. In describing Jesus Christ, it says, For by him are all things made, the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, principalities, powers, dominions, and authorities, all things created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. The author of the Quran didn't know that that was there when it said what it said. And so we just need to understand the thesis this evening. Did Muhammad preach the same message as Jesus? I have given you all the information you need. And I have just asked you, if you know Muhammad's teachings, where did he teach the things that Jesus taught about himself, about the gospel, about his crucifixion, his resurrection? He didn't. The thesis of the debate has been established. Thank you very much. Pages on the subject of what's called the pericope adulterate. 
I gave the textual information that's there. There's nothing new here to people who know the Bible. I don't believe that was written by John. The first manuscripts that contain it are from 500 years after John, and therefore I don't believe it's scripture, and there is nothing that any scholar of Christianity is going, wow, I've never heard that before, in hearing what I just said. How's that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you cranked it out of me. I'm not at all. It was terrible. <laughs> So, so the point is, that particular part of the Gospel of John, which is to be found in all, all the Bibles there on the table, uh, is not from God. And all the Bibles on the table there have a little note at the bottom that tells you that, it's not that, from God. It, no, that it is a not found in the earliest manuscripts. Fine. And I think that any ancient document that has been passed down by handwriting should have those notes in it. And I wish that there was a Quran on these tables that mentioned, at Surah 2, 222, that there are three different readings to that one verse found in the ancient manuscripts of the Quran. Does anyone have a Quran like that? Okay, okay. Does that have it? Okay, what? Okay, no, wait, 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 wait. I will, uh, I will uh, give you time, extra time, to read those readings on. That's a good claim you made in public. Bring those readings on and let's examine them. Yeah, whether they are actually we, different we, to each other. We did that no, back in September, no, remember? No, we didn't. <laughs> well, the debate's coming up. The debate's coming up. So the point I'm making, ladies and gentlemen, is, and again the question is to James, that those passages are not from God. Okay? Uh, you were talking about that. But I would say to you, every single text that I cited, I can defend as the original reading of each one of those texts from the manuscripts. And if you say otherwise, I challenge you to go to the manuscripts and demonstrate otherwise. Okay, that's, that's, that. I'm not even talking about that text. If there are passages within the gospel, for example, which can be established to be from another source than the authors, then there is a possibility that there are other chunks which were added, which we cannot establish today, to no. be from other sources. Of the no, that's what the that that there is there is the problem. You didn't hear me when I said this in London. Let me very briefly point out: Dr. Kurt Alon, one of the greatest uh, textual scholars of our age, has documented the existence of what's called the tenacity of the New Testament manuscript tradition. And it, once a reading appears in the tradition, it remains in the tradition. That means all the original readings are still there. We know where all the variants are. That is not really an issue at all. You could not say that, well, this entire book was okay. uh, came from some other time. So, 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 so we know up. exactly what Luke wrote in the first century. We, we, have, we have everything Luke wrote, and there are some places where we have to Do we know it? Here's the, yes, if you, in the sense that we possess it. But are there questions? Do we know, are there do we questions know? just as there are in the Quran where we have to there study no one or the other? Time's yes. up. Time's up. Time's up. James Turner. James Turner got me down. <laughs> I don't intend to get me down. This topic of our discussion this evening sure. is did Muhammad preach the same, preach the same message as Jesus? Yes. Will you admit that if you take the message of Jesus as found in only those documents that come from the time when Jesus lived, mm -hmm. first century, right. did do those documents mm -hmm. present the same message that Muhammad taught on the lips of Jesus? If the documents were authentically attributed to Jesus Christ and we could establish that Jesus definitely said those words, um, then I would believe in every single word Jesus Christ said. But un un unfortunately, it is impossible in my view to establish as to what Jesus may have said. The only way to determine what he may have said is to buy is is by using the Quran, which I believe to be the word of God. Last night, yeah. you at one point, and maybe you were just getting excited, I don't know, but okay. you quoted John 8:54 again. Sure. And I, I think you said yes. that I absolutely affirm mm -hmm. that this is the word of God. No, I said that about God, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29. I said that about that particular passage. And I am willing to which stand by which was what? Uh, which was here is where the God alone is one Lord. Okay. I thought uh, it was John. I could be wrong. Oh, no, I can confirm that today. I, I believe that John may have taken from oral tradition, which was around at the time, which may have originated from Jesus Christ. And I'm perfectly happy to accept that some parts of the Gospel of John, uh, which are attributed to Jesus Christ, or his statements, may be true, may be real. Uh, the only problem I have is that the Gospel of John is in, in its entirety is not even from John. And we have already established that. And if that is the case, then we have to apply a different criteria to establish what may be from Jesus 
uh, because we can't just take the Gospel of John at face value. So, what did Jesus teach on marriage? On marriage? From what you can authenticate by your standards as being the very words of Jesus, can we have any clue today mm -hmm. what Jesus taught on marriage? I will never know. You'll so never know. I will never know. So, and the Christians can never claim to know. So, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus quotes from Genesis. He gives that whole thing, but because of a later standard, we cannot know that Jesus said that. And so we, Jesus can't speak to marriage today. He can't speak to a major issue that we have in our society today. As I said already, uh, for the reason state, already stated that we simply cannot establish as to what Jesus really said because of the corruption of the Bible or the corruption of the New Testament, we have to apply uh, an external criteria to determine what he may have said. So for that reason, we have to go to the Jewish historical milieu. We have to go to the Jewish context and see what he taught was act what does actually fit into the Jewish context. If it doesn't fit into the Jewish context, it is not from him. It cannot be from him. How can you know anything about the Jewish context without using the very same documents from the first sure. century that you've just said you can't really No, know? We, we have a lot more documents from the Jewish uh, context. For example, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, Jewish commentaries. We have Jewish uh, histories. We have the writings of rabbis, all the rabbis. So we have a lot, a lot of documents and uh, information. Sorry? They all contain textual variation. Far more yes. textual variation than the New but, Testament. But with the New Testament, uh, as you know well, that for the New Testament, scribes were deliberately changing the text for, for sometimes theological reasons, for sometimes textual reasons, for sometimes even correcting mistakes. Okay, I'm going to ask you the very same question that we all are asking Bart Herman on this. When you make that kind of a claim, mm -hmm. how do you know they're changing it if you don't know what the original was? Because we see all of them, all the 6,000 manuscripts in front of us, and every single of those manuscripts is different in contents. I, I accept that uh, the differences are minor, majority of the differences are minor, and there are very few which are major, which do impact, which do affect uh, the, the theological beliefs of Jesus, the Christians today. But at the same time, we know for a fact that the manuscripts were changed. There's uh, no doubt about that. There's no debate on that point. But I'm not. Yeah. Here is the question. Yeah. Matt, let's go back to Matthew chapter 19. If you're going to say Jesus didn't say that, right. then you are making a positive... I'm saying claim. I don't know. I'm saying I don't know. He may have said it. I don't know. And I'm saying we have all these manuscripts. They all say that he said the same things right. there. Right. There's no doubt about that. Right. If you ask the most... Most radical skeptic. Ask Bart Ehrman. Okay. What do you think the New Testament was about? And he'll okay. say pretty much what it says. Let, let's assume that we had a, a, a signed copy by Matthew. And Matthew definitely wrote what he wrote in that signed copy. And Matthew attributes that saying to Jesus Christ. That's your how, standard? Okay. How do we know what Matthew tells us is true? So that will be your standard. Okay. I'm out. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. respectfully Absolutely. with one another and not have to compromise. Our society doesn't understand that you can do this. They're afraid of us doing this. My point is, if we stop doing this, the only thing left we can do is fight each other. We have to keep doing this. It's important. accepted any, any uh, they didn't accept the triune nature of God, they just accepted one and that's all. And I'm just wondering if you're aware of Genesis 1.26, Genesis 3.22 and Genesis 11.7. I'm uh, just going to read them. Well, so I'll just uh, quote, uh, I'll just quote one of them because they all say a similar thing in terms of the tri triune nature of God, or at least that God is not necessarily one. Uh, one person, that is. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Sure. And yes. the, the other ones say something similar in terms of our, us, you know. 
Thank you for that question. The question is that uh, there are passages in the, the Old Testament which imply uh, pluralism in, in divinity, uh, in Godhead. And what do I think of that? I'm telling you what your authorities are saying. There are Christian authorities, people like William Lane Craig, who have come out in public and have said openly, and he's one of the biggest debaters in the world as far as the Christians are concerned, uh, and he has clearly stated the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't exist in the Old Testament. It doesn't exist. So Christians now need to stop trying to support the doctrine of the Trinity from the Old Testament. The only source they are left with now are some passages which are very vague in the New Testament. Let me finish. In the New Testament, one passage was actually quoted by James tonight, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, in response to what I had to present from the same Gospel, chapter 15, verse 24, where Jesus said that I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he responded by quoting 28, 19. So there are major theologians again, people like Graham Stanton from the University of Cambridge, who believe that this was a late tradition. This 2819, the, the, the universal formula, go into the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Genesis okay. 26. This is a late tradition, according to some scholars. Again, Christians, not Muslims. So Christians are telling us, quite honestly, in many cases, that these passages are problematic. We simply cannot take them at face value. Jesus as a Jew only preached to the Jews. He never preached to the Gentiles. This much is established. <coughs> you never addressed that verse. Yeah. 126. Sorry. No, sorry. Just one question. Sorry about that. Yeah. He didn't, didn't, answer, didn't answer it at all. <coughs> well, you know, we've got you guys. Can we count standards? Sorry about that. And it's uh, two minutes. So, next question for James White. Well, yesterday I asked one question from Gospel of Mark and you said that uh, these passages are not necessarily manuscripts, so they are not part of the early manuscripts, so it has to be removed. Today you quoted from Mark 1, 1, and you quoted, if I can quote that, this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, who became just as Prophet Messiah had written for us. So there's a footnote down there that says that some manuscripts do not include the term Son of God. So, what is it? I mean, how do you guess that, that this is not original? This word is original or not original? From where you match it, from where you get this asserts that this is the word of God. It's not original. Thank, Thank you. And I would just like to point out that when I quoted Mark one one, hopefully those who were listening carefully heard me specifically point out the existence of the text of Um because I'm well aware of it and I have in front of me. Uh, I can give you the list of the manuscripts that specifically have the reading of containing it or not containing it. It's right here, available to anyone. Anyone can provide themselves this type of information. And you say, how do you make the decision? You examine based upon the quality of the manuscripts, how old the manuscripts are, how reliable the manuscripts are. You also look at the internal uh, evidences. For example, uh, in the ancient uh, writing of the script of, of Greek, Koine Greek, the Christians use something called nomina sacra, nomina sacra, which means the sacred names. God, Jesus, Spirit, Lord, were all abbreviated as two letters with a line on the top. When you write that in unsealed Greek, the, the phrase that's found, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you can engage in an error called homo etelutan. You see similar endings and your eye skips over it. This is something we do when we write something with I-N-G or T-I-O-N. We're copying something, we look back and we skipped over something because there's another word down the line that ends the same way. Very common thing in copying of manuscripts. We can see it happening. It happens, for example, I can show it to you if we had time on 1 John 3, 1. But the point is that it's very easy to understand how the phrase the Son of God could have been left out of some of those later manuscripts because of when we tell you, Tom. The point is, we examine this. We look at it. We have all the manuscripts right out there. We need to have that information because my point is any work of antiquity that has been handwritten and transmitted in a handwritten way needs to have that kind of examination done upon it. We're way ahead of, of Muslims on this uh, in the study of our text in comparison to the production of a uh, critical text of the Quran. It's happening, but it's happening very slowly. And I'm looking forward to uh, in the, you know, that happening in the, uh, sorry, in the near future. Next question for Sanji. Yes. Uh, how could Allah be eternally personal and relational if there was no one to relate with? Uh, 
if there was just Allah without Trinity, how could he be personal or relational if it was just him? Okay, although this question is not directly related to the topic, but I will still address it. Um, uh, Allah is personal because Allah is all hearing, um, all seeing. Okay? Um, Allah hears and he sees and he has knowledge of even a leaf dropping from a tree. Okay? Even an ant when it walks on earth, Allah is aware of those footsteps. Okay? So Allah states in the Quran in chapter 2 that those of you, my slaves, who call upon me, I am close. I am close. So Allah is very personal. The Prophet of Islam has taught us that if you want to ask Allah for anything, ask Him directly and you will get it. Because He hears. So why do you live in the power of God? Why, why do we even live in the power of God? Okay, why do we assume that He's not listening to us? When you pray to Him with a sincere heart, with a heart which is open to Him, He will listen. Okay. I think I didn't make myself clear. I mean like before the creation, there was just God, nobody else. Yes. How was he eternally person? Right. Because, like, the vision because his attributes. Yeah. Like, his. Um, in your turn, you can. You can no, no, no. It's like, what his question is. I'm trying to make it help you understand it. Uh, I understand. Okay. Okay. So, personal. Um, how can he be eternally personal? Um, but, okay. We believe the attributes of God are all eternal with him. He's all hearing eternally. He's all knowledgeable eternally. He's a creator eternally, even though he hasn't yet created. So, because he had the knowledge of his uh, creatorship, he knew that he is the creator. He is eternally a creator. So, all his attributes are eternal with him, even though he doesn't practice his attributes. That doesn't really actually impact or affect his attributes in any way. That's our answer to that question. Thank you.
But why do you keep appealing to things such as last night that when you brought them up and James rebutted them and you accepted the rebuttal and you have brought up the same thing tonight, you've done it on at least two occasions. For example, you were talking about um, how it took so long for all the different uh, Gospels to come together from all the different parts. James answered that last night and you accepted it. He said, we weren't living in an age of a fax machine all that time ago. And you said, okay, right, well, fair enough, like, I'll, I'll leave that one here. But you brought up the same argument tonight. It's on the video. I mean, people can check it out and all the rest of it. So if you weren't there last night, check out the video. Oh, on so why do you do that? Okay, I think you haven't been paying attention to my words. I made it very, I made it very clear. I made it very clear that I don't believe the gospels to be from God. Okay, and I have strong, solid reasons to believe that. Okay, I don't believe that they are from God. The only reason I quote them is that is that I acknowledge that they come from the first century. These are documents written by some people in the first century, which have been corrupted on a massive scale. Okay. And there is some information therein which may have come from Jesus Christ because there was an oral tradition in circulation and these people definitely took this information from some people talking about Jesus Christ somewhere. Okay? So the only way for us to establish as to what may be true or what may be actually uh, from Jesus Christ or not is by applying an external criteria which is the, the Jewish context in the first century, okay? So when we look at the Jewish context, and anything that conforms to the Jewish context, whatever is attributed to Jesus Christ, then it may be true, okay? So I made myself very clear. There is no inconsistency here. Again and again, people are actually ignoring what I'm saying. I am clearly now saying again, that I believe that there may be words in the Gospels which may have come from Jesus Christ, because of the origin transmission they copy from. The only way for us to know what he might have said is to buy, is, is, is by applying an external criteria, not by taking the gospel um, at face value. Already stated a, a, a clear reason. Here you have a theologian he, who's written 20 books. He's saying that we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. If you don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, who told you it's the word of God? Who told you it's the word of God? Think, think, Christian, think. This is something very, very important. You need to think about it. Amram, uh, you didn't answer my question. Sorry, the question. You, you, you answered a completely different question, but thanks for doing that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Come back later. Yeah. You can ask okay. me after. <laughs> Next question, please. I'm going to wait. Uh, back. He's going to scream as well. Yeah. I just want to say, first of all, I appreciate the two of you guys being here and uh, presenting a great lecture. And you know, I just want to thank you guys for coming. Uh, I, just have, I just have two points I want to make. Uh, I have two questions. First, you said you, uh, you said that in, the, in your oh, statement, you said one, one question. Oh, one question. question. Yeah. Okay, take the best one now. <laughs> that one, impression, man. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, then I'll relate to the actual point, man. You said that uh, Jesus knew he was going to be crucified. But when it says in the Bible, Jesus says, uh, and I, I'll try and alliterate on this to try and make you understand my view, is Jesus says, God, why have you forsaken me? So here you have a, tr uh, a trinity understanding where Jesus is God. Now we find God and Jesus at the same time. It's like me saying, oh me, why have I forsaken me, me? It doesn't make sense to me. How can I say, God, why have you forsaken me? If I knew I was going to be crucified first, and second, if I actually am God. It, it, it doesn't I'm, make sense. I'm really, really thankful that you weren't at the debate last night. You wouldn't have asked that question because I already answered it once, but I'll answer it now. First of all, you do not understand the doctrine of Trinity. And I want you to give me your email address afterwards, and I will send you for free my book, The Forgotten Trinity, so you can understand what the doctrine of Trinity is. Jesus is not the Father. We do not believe he's the Father. The Father sent the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Son prayed to the Father. Read John chapter 17. Father, glorify me with the glory which I had in your presence before the world was. We do not believe that the Father is the Son, or the Son is the Father. So Jesus is addressing the Father, who did not become incarnate. And by the way, what he's quoting is Psalm 22.1. Look it up. Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm. It is a psalm filled with prophecies of the crucifixion of Jesus, which you, if you are a Muslim, don't even believe happened. Against all of history and the prophetic tradition, in fact, what I'm going to do right now is, here's an entire book on the prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament, and I'm giving it to my friend Adnan, and you can steal from him if you want to. But, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Adnan. Uh,
the entire, the, the, this 22nd Psalm is an incredible description of the crucifixion itself. And so he's quoting from the Old Testament, and he's, he's praying to the Father, which is what the doctrine of the Trinity teaches. So my friend, you just don't understand the doctrine of the Trinity, I will be happy to try to at least, don't, wouldn't you agree that if you're going to reject something, you should at least know what it is? I have taken the time to understand what Tawhid is. I am writing a book, I am co-authoring a book right now with a Muslim scholar on Trinity and Tawhid. I have read entire books on Tawhid. Why? Because I respect you enough to know what you believe. You need to understand what I believe. And right now you know. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Next question. question to Mr. Adnan, the new prophet. But I was wondering that uh, Muhammad says that Angie is the word of God. The Muslim believe the older prophet, believe the Torah, believe the Angie. And if they say believing on an angel, what they believe? You are now, you say, you don't believe the New Testament and nothing. Are you the new prophet or we have to follow Muhammad? Thank you very much for that question. Firstly, thank you very much, James, for this fascinating book. Uh, the title is Behold Your King Prophetic Proofs That Jesus Is The Messiah. You know what? You didn't even have to write this chunky book. The Quran tells us in one word that Jesus is the Messiah. So we want to it. So, thank you very much for um, So, coming to your question very quickly. Uh, we, the Quran doesn't even acknowledge the fact that the writings of Paul are, are there as worthy, as worthy of attention. Quran doesn't acknowledge the plural, pl plurality of Gospels. Quran simply says, Jesus preached one good news, one gospel. Okay? It doesn't even acknowledge, for example, James asked a question that why does the Quran even comment on the writings of Paul and the writings of uh, John or other authors of the New Testament? Why does the Quran comment on, for example, Herodotus or, um, you know, Tacitus or even Cicero or all the other Roman historians and Eusebius and Sozominus and Theodore, all of these people? There is such a big list. If someone wants to come to me today, the Quran doesn't talk. Why does the Quran have to talk about these things? These things are not important. Paul is not from God. John never wrote a gospel from God. Luke never wrote a gospel from God. So why does the Quran have to acknowledge? Now, the problem here is, you have to understand that the Quran view is that there was one book taught and preached by Jesus, which we don't have, period. Doesn't exist, okay? Um, there was a Torah. Torah means law, the law. Quran doesn't even acknowledge that there were five books, the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy, Genesis, Numbers, Leviticus, and uh, what's the fifth one? Uh, I forgot the name of the fifth one. <laughs> the old, I always get the order. Yeah. Exodus, yes, thank you. So, Quran doesn't even acknowledge the name of these books. The Quran simply says, there was a law given to Moses, and that law existed. Do we have it, to, do we have it today? No, we don't. So, it's very simple. What is so difficult about this? Principle embodied in that law 
And he's applying it to people who have become experts at quoting the words, but not living the life. And so what Jesus does is he takes that law. In fact, the beautiful thing, my friend, is, is if you look at Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah chapter 31 talks about the fact that God is going to make a new covenant with the people of Israel. And that new covenant is what is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And one of the descriptions of everyone who's in the new covenant is that they all know God. Many of the people in the nation of Israel did not know God. They only knew about God. And he will write his law upon their hearts. You see, the Christian relationship to God's moral law is that because my heart of stone has been taken out and I've been given a heart of flesh, then I rejoice to do what pleases my Lord. It's, I, I obey because I love, not because I fear. That's a completely different ethic, to obey because I love the one who gave the law, rather than just fearing that I'm going to be punished. That's, that's why we, isn't that why we truly love as, in, in our relationships with husbands and wives and children? So you see, it's, you misunderstood what Jesus was saying. He never said what you attributed to him. Oh, 
uh, I can bury you under scholarly citations on this, and I will do so if I need to. Monogamous does mean unique. There's no question it means unique. But the point is that the sonship of Jesus is obviously completely different than anyone else's. It is presented in a completely different way. So much so that the Jews, the whole reason that they take offense at Jesus' identification of himself as the son is because they recognize he is making himself God. That's what John chapter 5 is all about. When he said that the son is working even as the father is working, they recognized he was making himself equal with God. And so you've just got to allow the text to speak for itself. Just because the term son of God can be used as something other doesn't mean that there cannot be a greater and more full fulfillment in Jesus Christ. In the same way that Jesus is a prophet, but he's not just a prophet. You all want to just limit things to one category, but can be nothing more. You don't do that in the Quran, and you don't do that with Muhammad, but you do that to us. You're using different standards. And you're violating what the Quran itself says when you do that, because you're supposed to use equal weights. And so the fact of the matter is, yes, there are other people who are called sons of God, but they are not identified as the son of God with the term monogamous used of him, not only in John, but also in the Synoptic Gospels. You see the very, I saw, I showed you in, in, in Mark, where he uses son of man of himself in a way that, the, how did Jews respond? You've heard the blasphemy. Why did they say that? If it was not the intention of those authors to communicate to us something very special of the set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bosby, because that concludes the question and answer session. Now we have finally a five minute uh, conclusion session by the speaker. We'll start off with the. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Professor Rahim. Thank you very much for being present today. It's been an amazing and exciting debate. It is always a pleasure to debate uh, Dr. James White, although we differ on major issues with regards to religion, but we are brothers in humanity. We will always be brothers. And I pray for James, I'm sure James prays for me, and I wish him the best best of uh, this world and the hereafter, and I'm sure he wishes the best for me. So today's debate was whether Jesus and Muhammad preached the same religion. I already clarified my position that Jesus was historically speaking a Jewish prophet who preached in a Jewish milieu, and he has to be considered as a prophet, as a messenger of God within the Jewish context in the first century. Uh, the Gospels cannot be taken at face value for the reasons already stated. Gospels have to be scrutinized extensively, thoroughly, in order to get to the, the truth as to what Jesus really preached. And when we actually see what he preached uh, within the Jewish milieu, or whatever he preached actually conformed to the Jewish context of the time, we see that it was exactly Islam. He preached monotheism, strict monotheism. There is only one God here in Israel. There is only one God. Then he preached strict, uh, strict adherence to the law. You must uphold the law. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, we are told that he clarified his position, that I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets. In chapter 15 of the book of Matthew, he rebukes the Pharisees for not following the law. When the Pharisees talked to him, asking him, why didn't you wash your hands before you ate? He rebuked them for not practicing a law which can be found in the Old Testament, where it is stated that if a child insults the parents, that child must be put to death. And he rebukes them for not following that law. So Jesus, if anything, we can find that he upheld the Jewish law, which is exactly what Islam stood for. When Islam came, Islam simply abrogated some of the things of the Jewish law and brought the final law for mankind. Prophet Muhammad was indeed a prophet of God. There is no doubt about that. To such an extent, ladies and gentlemen, that there are some Christian scholars, people like Montgomery Watt from the University of Edinburgh, who was a Christian, he stated that we simply cannot accuse Muhammad of imposture. There is far too much in his life for us to simply reject him as an imposter. And in, in fact, he stated that he was indeed inspired by God. He was indeed inspired by God. Why? Because when you look at the man's life, you see what he was preaching and teaching exactly conformed to what was being preached and taught by Moses in message. And what was the message? There is only one God. All children of Israel, 
all the people of the world. Ya ayyuhal nafs. There is only one God. Don't worship idols. Don't worship men. Don't worship stones. Don't worship trees. Worship one God alone. Which was worshipped worship by Jesus Christ himself. How did he pray, ladies and gentlemen? He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He fell on his face and he prayed to God. Did you see us pray in the beginning? That's how we pray. We the Muslims pray just like Jesus prayed. We the Muslims pray just like Moses prayed, fell on his face and he prayed to God. Abraham fell on his face and he prayed to God. This is all in the Bible. They washed before they prayed. They did ablution. We do that, ladies and gentlemen. Look at our woman. They look like Mary. Show me one Christian woman who looks like Mary today. You will not find one, except Catholics, of course. <laughs> and some of you believe Catholics are not Christians. And that doesn't help us anyway. Now, Jesus, when he greeted his companions, his disciples, in the Gospel of John, in the later part, um, we are told that he comes to them, he, he, he says to them, peace be upon you. Peace be upon you. How do the Muslims greet each other? I want the Muslims to say, Assalamu alaikum. What does it actually mean? Peace be upon you. We are more Christians than the, than, than the Christians are, ladies and gentlemen. You know why? Because we follow the Christ of the Quran and the Bible. And the Quran, Christ of the Quran is no different to the Christ of history. In the Quran, in chapter 5, verse 72, 73, and 74 and 5, we are told that Jesus tells his people, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity getting it wrong, the Quran getting it wrong, Mr. James White, we had a debate on this topic, he's wrong. The Quran, in chapter 5, verse 116, doesn't mention the doctrine of the Trinity anywhere. It simply states that there were Christians who worshipped Mary. There are Christians today who worship Mary and Ireland, the Catholics do it. And they call Mary the mother of God, Theotokos. So is the Quran wrong? The Quran doesn't say that's the doctrine of Trinity. The Quran simply says that Jesus and his mother are being worshipped as deities beside God. Is that true? Yes, that is true. But should it be done? No, that is shit, that's polytheism. And those who indulge in these practices are going straight to hellfire if you don't fix up. Because this is what Jesus said in the Quran, we are told. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to again thank you for being here this evening and say that yes, I, I do pray for Anand. As I pray for any Muslim, I obviously pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed to him. I do thank him for uh, our debates this evening and I look forward to further debates with him in the future. I just want to clear up a few items. Uh, Anand had made the mention of a particular scholar who says that the text of Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and following is an addition. I just want to point out there is absolutely no historical evidence for that. Why does he say that? Because he has a theory. And scholars love theories. It helps them get published. And uh, his theory is that no Jew would ever believe that. Wow. In other words, Jesus can be nothing more than the Jews expected him to be. There's your argumentation. Not much argumentation there. It would be very easy to debate somebody on that issue. I'd also like to talk to you a little bit about paradise. Someone asked a question about paradise. You know what paradise is for a Christian? It's not a place where you get what you want. Paradise for a Christian is being united with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Being where he is, worshiping God in the spirit of truth. That's what paradise is. It's not a physical place where you, you get physical things. It's being united in perfection with your creator. I would like to ask Adnan. The Quran says... In Surah chapter 5. He's not responding to this. I've noticed this is interesting. I keep reading this up. And I don't know that my Muslim friends have an answer for this. But Surah 5 says to the people of the gospel, the al al Injil, that we are to judge by what is contained therein. Fihi. It refers to the Injil. How am I supposed to do that today? In light of what Adnan has said this evening. He doesn't believe I can know anything about what the gospel actually said. So, is Surah 547 aggregated? Did it have any meaning in the day that, that it was recited by Muhammad? Because you know, it all came down in the al and then it was piecemealed out over this period of time. And, and on the day that Surah 547, which by the way, you don't know what day that was, do you? What if I made that the standard? You don't know the day it was, so it can't be the word of God. That's easy to do. It's meaningless, but that's easy to do. If on the day it was quoted to the Christian people, how could they obey the words? They're judged what's contained therein. According to Adnan, they didn't have it anymore. It makes the words of the Quran meaningless. Double talk. I've never gotten an answer. Never gotten an answer to that. 
You see, he asked, why should the, why should the Quran address Theodosius or, or this, that, or the other thing? The Quran should accurately address the New Testament and its teachings concerning the person of Jesus Christ because as Adnan just said, if you believe him, you're going to hell. And if what he just said is true, then shouldn't it be the case that his book of scripture accurately represents mine, which says is wrong, which comes after it? His, his revelation comes after mine. Why can't it accurately represent it? Why can't it interact with it when it's telling me to believe it is to go to hell? I think that's sort of important, don't you? Twice now he said, if you pray to Jesus, even though Jesus said in John 14, 14, the same gospel he normally quoted, in John 14, 14, Jesus spoke about prayer to himself. He says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is after he's gone back to heaven. But Adnan says, if you believe what's in John 14, 14, then I challenge him. Be consistent at this point, then you're going to hellfire. Let me tell you something. He asked a question. Why is God so bloody? Why does God have to send his own son? Oh, Adnan, hear me. The son came freely. As he said in the gospel, you quote it more often than any other. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down in my own accord. And why does he do that? He does that because his law cannot simply be shoved off the side because it represents his holiness. God's attributes cannot simply be done away with. And so what God has done in the gospel is he has provided a way whereby my sin, my guilt is borne by another. Not so I can just live any life I want, so that he can change me and make me like my Savior. His law is honored, his holiness is maintained, and his love and mercy is demonstrated, and that's what Jesus Christ is all about. And I say to you, the teachings we have seen consistently in the only source we can come up with for Jesus' teachings were not the teachings of Muhammad. We have seen that beyond any and all question. The thesis of the debate has been established. Thank you for being here this evening.